Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here. So this is joint work uh, with Andrei Krutov. And uh, he's much younger than me, but he's actually the senior partner. So I may need to consult him for some trickier questions. OK, so this is some funding information. We'll skip it. It has some nice colors. That's important. OK, so let's first uh, review quickly the classical setting for the cubic Dirac operator. So G will be a complex, uh, simple or semi-simple Lie algebra with killing form B. And then the non-commutative Weyl algebra of G is W of G is U of G tensored with the Clifford algebra of G. So this is the Clifford algebra with respect to this form B. And this is a, already some sort of quantized version, but we want to quantize it further. But it's a, like the completely classical thing would be just the Weyl algebra. And that's the commutative version of this. So S, S of G or S of G star tensored with wedge of G star. So this one was introduced and studied but by Alexeyev and Mein Rankin. So let EA be a basis of G, let FA be the corresponding dual basis with respect to our form B. And then this cubic Dirac operator would be defined as uh, some EA tensor FA plus G. It's an element of this non-commutative Weyl algebra. Uh, this gamma, it's a special, we'll see later, a formula. So it's it's an element of degree three in the Clifford algebra. So it's only in the Clifford algebra. So this is called the cubic Dirac operator. It was uh, introduced and studied by Goethe and Constant. And it's uh, it's a little more general. You can have another, you can have a subalgebra to which this form B restricts non-degenerately. And then you can have some relative version of this cubic Dirac operator. Basically, you sum only over the basis for the complement of the subalgebra. Okay, then the reason why you are allowed to call it a Dirac operator is the fact that its square is some sort of Laplacian. So in this case, this squared would be the Casimir element of G plus some scalar, and the scalar is one over twenty-four trace of the Casimir in the adjoint representation. So Casimir is, of course, some EA times FA inside U of G. So it's the, it's the smallest interesting central element. And it appears, of course, in many places. And then the idea for the Dirac operator, it's supposed to be a little bit finer. So the Casimir has some eigenvalues in the module. And these are interesting, but this Dirac being the square root will have more eigenvalues, so you'll get more information. That was the motivation for Dirac to introduce such an operator. You cannot, if you look very classically, like over Rn, you can clearly not find the square root of the Laplacian if you stick with real or complex scalars. But we, if you allow yourself to have Clifford scalars, then, then you can. That's the point. So you need some anti-commuting scalars. And then our main case is SL2. And then if you take this standard basis, E, F, and H, then this is the formula, E tensor F plus F tensor E plus one half H tensor H. This is maybe the killing form is, is rescaled to the trace forms. And then F and E, they are dual to each other. And H is dual to half H. And then the cubic, term is this EHF plus H. So it looks like it's not degree three because it's not homogeneous, but in fact, it is homogeneous. So this Clifford algebra, it is not a graded algebra with respect to the usual filtration, but still you can talk about degree because you have some skew symmetrization from the exterior algebra. And then this element, which looks not homogeneous is actually homogeneous with respect to this grading. And then the square will be the Laplacian. Laplacian is EF plus FE plus half H squared, and then plus this cost constant one half. Okay, and then some things that you can do with this. 
you can study Dirac cohomology. Like in modules, you take a module for U of G and then you tensor it with a spin module for the Clifford algebra. And then you can talk, you can consider the action of this Dirac element or operator. And then you can, you can consider some kind of cohomology like a kernel modulo the intersection of the image and the kernel. And this is an interesting invariant. It is often zero, but when it's non-zero, then you, then you have some nice properties of the modules in question. So there was a conjecture by Vaughan that infinitesimal character is determined by the Rako homology. This was proved by Jing Song Huang and myself a long time ago, and then it started a series of applications. Then there is Alexeyev and Mein Rankin work. So that's about Cartan's model and equivariant cohomology. So non-commutative version of equivariant cohomology. That was their motivation. Then Costant was uh, talking about multiplets of representations. These are actually the, the components of this Dirac cohomology in the relative case. And he had also an algebraic version of morel veil theorem, some generalization. So the quadratic spaces, then there is some work, I'm going to mention just some names, Kulis, Djurjevic, Dandra, Dabrowski, Kramer, Tucker, Simmons, Matassa, and others. So they talk about some sort of Dirac operators in quantum setting. And well, you, you see, it's a little bit, maybe it deserves a little comment. So when you, we call it Dirac operator, in fact, it's an element of some algebra. When you say operator, you mean the action in some module. So you can you can look at some concrete module, which maybe appears in geometry, and then you can look at the Dirac operator acting there. Or you can consider this, you can call it universal Dirac operator, which is an element of this algebra, UG tensor Clifford of G. And we are after this second interpretation of the universal Dirac operator. Then there is a gauge theory on non-commutative principal bundles. Now this has been studied by Chachich and Mesland. Actually, it was conversations with Chachich uh, that got us started on this project. So he had this nice gauge theory that was actually here in Prague four years ago, I think. So he had, he had a talk about this gauge theory on non-commutative principal bundles. And I had a talk about some different version of quantum Dirac operator. And then he came to me later and said, well, can you give me some cubic quantum Dirac operator to work with? So can this non-commutative whale algebra, can it be quantized? Then he could quantize his construction. And then Andre was there also. And then we decided to try to do it. And so far we succeeded with SM2, it's a little modest, but we hope to be able to generalize. And then there is some uh, some previous work I have with Peter Somberg in the algebraic setting. So we did some relative version for SL2 and we are still working on extending that to SL3. Okay, then I'm gonna quickly review uh, Greenfield Jimbo's quantum group construction for the SL2 case. So Q will be a complex number, not a root of unity. Often it could be a root of unity, but I exclude it for some simplifying reasons. Then UQSL2 is the algebra generated by E, F, K, and K inverse, subject to relations. So K and K inverse, they are really inverse to each other. Then conjugated E by K produces a scalar Q squared and conjugated F by K produces the scalar Q minus two. And then the main relation is EF minus FE equals K minus K inverse over Q minus Q inverse. And then, so it's not only an algebra, it's also a Hopf algebra. And so there is a coproduct, a coproduct sends E to E tensor K plus one tensor E, sends F to F tensor one plus K inverse tensor F and sends K to K tensor K, and K inverse will go, would go to K inverse tensor K inverse. And then the antipode inverts K, sends E to minus E K inverse, sends F to minus KF. And then there is also the co-unit epsilon, 
sends k to one and e and f to zero. And then it's a Cobb algebra that's well known. And then representation theory was actually already shown to us. So for every integer m greater than or equal to zero, there is a unique type one irreducible representation of dimension m plus one. So classically, the highest weight would be m. Here it will be q to the m. It is spent by vectors vm, vm minus two. So I'm not doing this half integer version. Sorry about that. I'm just used to this. In the classical setting, this is the more usual version. So vm, vm minus two down to v minus m. And then the action is okay, acts on vi by the scalar q to the i. F goes down and E goes up with some scalars. And there was the lecture by Junken yesterday, so I don't have to write the scalars. And we already saw the explanation why really you have all these modules. And these are basically the only ones with positive weights. That's type one. Okay, then we are also going to need the quantum adjunct action. So the left adjunct action of U Q S L two on itself is defined, and it's actually a more general definition, but we stick to S L two. So add A of B is sum of A one B antipoid of A two, where A one and A two are taken from the coproduct. So the coproduct of A is sum of A one tensor A two. So this is the definition. And then we can compute it explicitly for our generators. So for any B in UQSL2, we can look what happens when this A is E. And then the coproduct was two slides back. And the result is at EB is EBK inverse minus BEK inverse. F acts on B as FB minus K inverse BKF. And K and K inverse, they simply act by conjugation. And now we are going to consider the following nice small submodule. So V2 is E, v, is, uh, v minus two is KF. So you see classically you would have E, F and H inside the enveloping algebra. That would be certainly an adjunct submodule isomorphic to SL2. Here it's a little bit different, but somewhat similar. So you have E, you have KF, you have to correct F a little bit. And then instead of H, well, you don't have H here in our interpretation, but this V0 is Q minus two EF minus FE. You see, if Q would be one, then it would be EF minus FE. So that would be H. And here it's some quantum version of H. So these elements span a three-dimensional submodule of the adjunct module. So I think this should be called a quantum Lie algebra. I don't understand what exactly quantum Lie algebra is. If somebody can tell me, I would be very grateful. For example, for SL3, I would like to see it explicitly, so, something like this. So I asked Lustig, that's the guy I know that knows about quantum groups. He told me, I not, don't know anything about quantum Lie algebra. So I hope somebody here maybe knows. So, so here is like what the action looks like explicitly. So it can be written down completely explicitly, of course. So you can see that E goes up, F goes down and K acts by the required scalars. And it's a little bit different from, from this standard module where F just simply goes down here, it goes down with some scalars. So. It's a slightly different choice of basis. You could renormalize this basis to get it exactly like in the abstract description of the modules. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about braided monoidal categories. So the category we have in mind is the representations of UQG of type one. And I mean finite dimension representations. So what it means, it means well, like loosely speaking, you can tensor representations. How can you tensor them? Well, the action is given by the coproduct. And then tensoring is associative. And furthermore, there is a natural isomorphism called braiding, sigma, between 
in the functor of tensoring, or maybe by functor of tensoring, and tensoring with the flip in the opposite order. So you can write, it's not just the flip, it's some more complicated thing that's called braiding. And that's somehow given, I'll tell you in a minute how it is given. So there are now some certain properties that I will skip explicitly, but I'm sure many of you know it very well. So there is there are some hexagonal di diagrams and there is the young Baxter equation. And then how this braiding is, so you can make some abstract definition of braiding, but here we have something more concrete in mind. So the braiding is defined using the universal R matrix. So this R is an element of UQG tensor with itself, but it's some infinite sum. So it lives in some completion. So if V with action rho V and W rho W are two modules, then this braiding sigma with respect to R on V tensor W would be, you take this R, then you apply it to the module. This is this rho V tensor rho W of R. So that's now an operator in the module. And then you flip that. So this is the braiding. Tau denotes the flip. So for UKSL2, this R matrix is very explicit. So it's Q to H tensor H over two. So I was proud of skipping H, but now here it appears. Cannot get rid of H completely. So this factor Q to H tensor H over two, and then there is some infinite sum. There is some scalar, some quantum numbers and their factorials appear. And then there is EM tensor FM. So you see, it looks like an infinite sum, but when you take a finite dimensional module, then eventually the sufficiently large power of E will kill your module, also sufficiently large power of F. So, so it will be all, always a finite sum if you are in some concrete module. Okay, so why do we want this braided stuff? So the point is to take braided tensor products of algebras. So let A and B be associative algebras in the braided monoidal category C sigma. So what we mean here, so we want our algebras will be also UQG modules. And we want the algebra action to be compatible. So the algebras in this category of UQG modules. And then you, you cannot take just the ordinary tensor product algebra. That would not, that, that would not no longer be compatible with the, with the action of, of the UQG. But we take this A tensor sigma B. So that's the associated algebra in the same category with the multiplication given as follows. So you, you should have this multiplication. So it goes from A tensor B, tensor A tensor B to A tensor B. So it's a vector space, it's, it's an ordinary tensor product. But the multiplication is such that you, you take this combination, you have to somehow pass this middle, two middle factors. So A has to pass through B. And for this, you need, uh, you use this braiding, sigma of BA and keep the outer factors the same, and then you just multiply first factors and second factors. So why do we talk about this? You see, we want to define our quantum uh, Dirac operator. It should be in the tensor product of UQG and the Clifford algebra CLQ of G, which I will define a little later. And then we want to compute the squared. So we really need the algebra structure. And we want everything to be compatible with UQG module structure. So this Dirac operator should be invariant for UQG. And so we need to take this braided algebra structure and then D squared is, is computed in that algebra. We tried long, long ago, we were trying to not use the braiding, but then we got some rubbish for the square. But to get a good square, you definitely need to use the braiding. Okay, then the next thing, so we want to talk about the Clifford algebra. So for that, we need a form. And so I should say what it means to have a form. So this could be defined for a Hopf algebra A and an A module V. Then we could have a bilinear form on V and we call it invariant. 
if the following is true, so sum of, remember this A1 and A2, they were from the coproduct. So coproduct of A is sum of A1 tensor A2. And then the sum of A1 acting, so this little triangle means that A1 is acting on B and A2 is acting on W. And then you sum it up. And the result should be basically zero most of the time, but it's epsilon of A times the form of V and W. And then, so you see, we want to work with our little quantum Lie algebra, which we call V2. So that's the span of our V2, V0, and V minus two. These are this E, K, F, and that quantum version of H in the middle. And then we want to find an invariant form. So some trial and error gives you the following way. So there is some freedom. It's of course up to scalar, you can rescale it. So we keep this C like a quantum scalar, which we, we can then fix as necessary or as wanted. So V2, V minus two is paired to be this C and then V0, V0 to make it invariant, it should be this quantum scalar times C and V minus two, V2 should be C times Q minus two. Then this is invariant as one can easily check explicitly. And then we defined uh, our Clifford, our quantum Clifford algebra as uh, tensor algebra V2 divided by the ideal I and I is generated by the following elements. So F X tensor Y plus some renormalized braiding sigma tilde of X tensor Y and then minus two times this form on X, Y. So classically, it would be X tensor Y plus Y plus Y tensor X, because classically this braiding is just the flip. And then we would have also minus two X, Y. So what is this normalized braiding? It's defined like, like this with the square root. So what happens, this usual Sigma would have eigenvalues, some powers of Q, but this normalized braiding has eigenvalues plus and minus one. And this is the one that fits into our definition. And then the algebra CLQSL2 is an associative algebra in the braided monoidal category of type one UQSL2 modules, simply because this ideal I is invariant under the agent action. And here is some list of the generators of the ideal more explicitly. I mean, it was a little like with this normalized braiding. So this is what it looks like when you're completely down to, down to earth. So you have these, these combinations. And the first one is nice and easy. And the last one is a little lengthier. So C is still our scalar, which we can fix as we like. And then this ideal I is homogeneous with respect to the standard Z2 grading. So we have this even odd that survives. So uh, the ideal defining the Clifford algebra is not homogeneous. So the Clifford algebra does not inherit the grading from the tensor algebra, but it does uh, because the relations are even. So the Z2 grading survives and you get a super algebra structure. And then one shows that the algebra, our quantum Clifford algebra is of PBW type. So the poincare birkovic theorem holds and you can use these generators to write monomials and you get the basis. And then the multiplication on the generators, so each by each. So V2 and V minus two are isotropic. And then there is some skew commutation, but with some with some uh, powers of Q. And V0, V0 is not a constant, like it would be classically, it would be a constant, but here you get, you see when Q is one, then this first term one minus Q to the fourth will be zero, and you will just get the constant. But here you also get this 
non constant term. And then uh, there is a non scalar central element in our Clifford algebra. It's defined like, like this is V2, V0, V minus 2 plus C, V0. So that's something like that cubic term from before. It's central, so in particular, it's invariant. And then the square of gamma is computed using the table on the previous slide. And you get the scalar. The scalar is C squared T squared, where T is C times square root of Q squared plus one over Q. So we write it T for short. And then this implies that there are two orthogonal center projections for projectors in C, C and Q, SL2. So one of them is proportional to gamma minus CT and the other to gamma plus CT. And then one now easily checks that this implies uh, our Clifford algebra is the direct sum of two ideals, I1 and I2, which are generated by this gamma one is gamma two. And then we can construct the two spin modules. So let S1 be a two dimensional vector space. And then we define the following action of our quantum Clifford algebra. So V2 acts by zero T zero zero. V0 acts by a diagonal element T over Q squared, 0, 0 minus T, and V minus 2 acts by 0, 0 T over Q0. And then one checks by some easy computation that gamma now acts by the scalar minus CT. So this means this ideal generated by gamma plus CT, that was called I1, so that will act by 0. And the other ideal will map to endomorphisms, and it is easy to show that it's actually isomorphic. So I2 is isomorphic to endomorphisms of S1 and I1 acts as zero. And then S2 is defined very similarly analogously. So you change a little bit this action and you obtain that now gamma acts by, not by minus CT, but by plus CT. And so in particular, this S1 and S2 are not isomorphic as modules over the Clifford algebra. And the algebra again maps onto S2. Now I2 acts as zero and I1 is isomorphic to the endomorphisms. So we see that our Clifford algebra is isomorphic to the direct sum of two endomorphism algebra. So these two modules. And so in particular, it's actually isomorphic to the classical Clifford algebra because this is one way to define classical Clifford algebra. In this case, when the space is odd, it's the sum of two uh, endomorphisms algebra of the spin modules. So you can say then why did we bother to define this quantum version when it's actually isomorphic? Well, it fits better with our formulas to have this. So it's a matter of change of basis, you could say, but also there is some intrinsic. You see Clifford algebra is not just an algebra. For example, it also has a natural filtration coming from, from the tensor algebra, from the construction. So this filtration would not be exactly the same. Also this action, so the classical Clifford algebra has the action of classical U of G. Here we have the action of U Q G. Well, you could define it in the other basis, but it's less natural. So it's to our advantage to use the quantum version, even though it is isomorphic as an algebra to the classical Clifford algebra. So the classical Clifford algebra would be generated by E, H, and F, and they satisfy much easier relations. So E squared and F squared are zero, H squared is the scalar, two. And then the anti-commutator of E and F is two, and E and F, they both anti-commute with H. And then one can write this isomorphism explicitly so our V2 corresponds to TE, V minus two corresponds to F up to this scalar T over two Q and predictably V zero is more, more complicated and less obvious.
Okay, so now we are ready to talk about quantum non-commutative veil algebra. So it's the associative super algebra UQSL2, braided tensor product with CLQSL2. So the multiplication is given, I'm actually repeating the definition here. So the, for the multiplication, you have X tensor V times Y tensor W is gonna be sum of X, Y, I tensor V, I, W where yi and vi, they are components of sigma on v tensor y. And then, of course, this is still, I mean, this sigma is sort of given explicitly, but it can be written completely explicitly. So this uh, non-commutative, quantum non-commutative veil algebra is an associated algebra in the braided monoidal categories of UQS of two modules. And then let's see, where do I have? I thought I had somewhere. Okay, I don't have the multiplication explicitly. Okay, so now we change notation slightly. So V2, V0 and V minus two are now denoted by X, Z and Y. And we introduce more, you see, that's one of the problems you have with this quantum Lie algebra it does not generate the enveloping algebra. So you have to add a little bit more. So here we add the quantum Casimir element. It's the usual one for SL2, EF plus this combination of Q, K and K inverse. And then we also add K inverse, call it W. So now these five elements, they will actually generate UQSL2. And here is now, our proposed Dirac operator. So the quantum cubic Dirac operator DQ is the following element of our non quantum non-commutative veil algebra. So you see, we have still the same principle. You have somehow basis and dual basis with respect to the form, they get combined. The scalars come from the form. And then there is the cubic term. So that's our gamma actually showing up here. And the little curious fact that we cannot completely explain it's kind of computational that this Casimir should appear here. So classically, you don't see this Casimir, but here it somehow fits. Remember our guiding principle is to get the nice square. And this is a way that we could find to get a nice square. And you can see it's even a little deceptive like when you try to take the classical limit, it looks like this whole cubic term will go away, but that's not really true. This Q squared minus one would become zero. The denominator is non-zero, but the thing is that this Casimir is not so good for passing to classical limit. It actually blows up. So you have to correct it with a scalar. And then this scalar actually will play a role also in computing the square and in seeing that classically you get uh, like when you pass to the classical limit, you get the original notions. So here is our formula for the squared. Now we have C squared. And again, so when we make this uh, correction of the Casimir, then actually this will become linear and the quadratic term will go away because the quantum scalar outside is, is zero. And uh, the quantum scalar that comes with the linear term, this zero stuff, this quantum zero stuff will actually disappear. And we compute that we exactly get the classical notion. So in particular, we see that D squared is a central element as it should be. So D is not central, but D squared is central, but D is still, so, okay, what I was saying for Q goes to one, you do get the classical notions and it's not immediately obvious from the formulas I wrote, but there are these other slightly different formulas that make it obvious. And then one also shows that this DQ is invariant under UQSL2 action. It's not in the center of the algebra, but it's invariant under the action. Okay, then so what, what else do we do? So we compute this, uh, we play a little bit with this Dirac cohomology. So we 
We consider finite dimension modules, also Verma modules, and we compute the cohomology. And most of the time it's zero, which is to be expected, but not always. So in some particular cases, we get something non-zero. We don't know if that's interesting for applications, but we do it because it's useful in the classical situation. So maybe somebody will know how to use it in the quantum setting. Then the next thing is star structures and real forms. So these are related notions. So let H be a Hopf star algebra. So if X is in H tensor H, then we do the star so that we do the star of each factor. And then R matrix is called real if the star is R21. R21 means you take this formula, big formula for the for your R, and then you just flip all the all the monomials, all the elementary tensors. And then on the other hand, uh, R is called inverse real if R star is equal to R inverse. So, so this big sum can actually be inverted in the form of power series sense. And this is R inverse. And if R star is that, then it's called inverse real. And then an algebra A is a star algebra in the category of H modules. If A is a star algebra and the compatibility with H action is as follows. So A acting on A and then star should be well, not just H star acting on A star, but antipode inverse of A star acting on H on A star. Okay, so the inverse real case, so what we are after here. So you see classically, it's important that for example, in unitary modules, your Dirac operator is self-adjunct and that's important for applications to unitarity. So this star uh, construction should be some analog of, of that. So if, if in the inverse real case, our star is our inverse, so let A, B be star algebras in the braided category of H modules. And then on the braided tensor product algebra, we define the star as follows. So A tensor B star, you take B star tensor A star, apply R and then flip. So re remember how taking the star, so the, the adjunct of Operator so matrices it reverses order so here you see this is taken care of you cannot just just reverse order you need to apply the R matrix whenever you do it so if absolute value of Q is one then there is only one real form of UQSL two so that's UQ of SL two R and the corresponding star structure is given by E star is minus E F star is minus F K star is K. And then for the quantum Clifford algebra, we have V2 star is minus V2, V0 star is minus Q squared V0, and V minus two star is minus Q squared V minus two. And then, so in this case, DQ is self-adjunct, which is analogous to the classical situation. So DQ star is equal to DQ. And then in the real case, it's a little different. There is some complication. So we actually consider two versions of the Brady tensor product. Uh, one is with respect to R and the other is with respect to R to one inverse. So you take the inverse and the flip and then take the Brady tensor product. And that's because our star actually switches these two. So it's not, it does not really act naturally on just one braided tensor product, but it switches these two slightly different braided tensor product algebras. So switches A plus and A minus. And so it's then natural also to consider two versions of our quantum non-commutative veil algebra. So one is braided tensor product of UQSL2 and CLQ of SL2 with respect to R, and the other is with respect to this other R matrix R21 minus 
inverse or to one inverse. And then we also get to define two cubic Dirac elements. So DQ plus is defined like this. So it's basically the same formula as before with some slight modification. And then the square, again, you get something similar as before. And this is central in uh, VQ plus of SL2. And analogously, you can define DQ minus, and it has the same square actually. The same formula for the square. And then the real form UQ SU2 is defined by E star is FK, F star is K inverse E, and K star is K. And then the corresponding uh, real form CLQ of SU2 is given by V2 star is Q squared V minus two, V zero star is V zero, and V minus two star is Q minus two V two. And then the real, the other real form is UQ SU one one. And it's defined by E star is minus FK, F star is minus K inverse E, and K star is still K. And again, you do something similar on the Clifford algebra. And then we have these star maps switching this positive and negative version of the, of the veil algebra. And we have that D plus star is D minus and D minus star is D plus. So they get switched by this parity, by this star operation. Okay. And now there is another little topic that we tried is to kind of quantize this notion of G differential spaces and algebras. In particular, we want to see, we want to see our quantum Clifford algebra as some sort of differential G differential algebra or UQ G differential algebra. So what is the classical setting here? G is a compact Lie group with Lie algebra G. Wedge of Xi is the Grassmann algebra with just one generator Xi. And then D is the derivative with respect to this Xi. And then G hat is G hat minus one plus G hat zero plus G hat one. So G minus one and G hat zero are actually two copies of G, but one is in degree minus one and the other is in degree zero. The one in degree minus one, you can index by this Xi. So you can think of this as G tensor wedge of C. And this G1 hat, it's one dimensional, it only has the differential D. And then for X in G, LX is X tensor one uh, and I iota X, the contraction is X tensor C. The non-zero brackets are as follows. LX LY is LXY. Lx i y is uh, iota of x y, and commutator of i x and d is l x. And then the g differential space is a superspace b together with a g hat module structure. So rho is a, a morphism of differential graded g g equivariant algebras from g hat into endomorphisms of b. And then a G differential algebra is a super algebra B equipped with the structure of G differential space such that rho X is a derivation of B for all X in G hat. So one example, one classical example is the exterior algebra of G star. We view it equipped with the quadrant action of G. So let EI be a basis in G, FI the dual basis in G star which we think of as wedge one of G star, and then C, I, J, K are the structure constants. And then we can define the contractions. On generators, they are defined by taking the form, and then they are defined to be super derivations. So then you extend them to products. And then the lead derivatives are given by this formula here involving the structure constants. So you basically 
you you remove e k and add f j. You remove actually f k. So iota e k will construct f k. And then you add it up over all k and j. The differential is given by Kozol's formula, half of sum f a tensor l e a. And then this is an example of a G differential algebra. One has to check some, some of the axioms. And one can show that the cohomology is exactly the G invariance in wedge of G star, and that's the same as the Lie algebra cohomology of G. And then the other example is the Clifford, the classical Clifford algebra. So now G has a non-degenerate invariant symmetric bilinear form. For example, killing form if it's semi-simple, but it can be more general than that. And then now let EI be an orthonormal basis of G. Again, we denote by CIJK the structure constants. So this CIJK, they can be expressed as B of commutatory I and EJ with EK. So that's an invariant alternating form. And then we have the following elements. We have, this is actually a copy of, of G inside degree two elements of the Clifford algebra. So you define GI, it's like some sort of image of EI. So that's sum over J and K, C, I, J, K, E, J, E, K with some, with some factor to correct it. And then gamma is the cubic element that's actually invariant that corresponds to this form, this B of, X, Y, Z. So it's defined as one third of some E, I, G, I. And then we define uh, the contractions iota I to be Clifford commutators with E, I. L, I is Clifford commutators with G, I. And the differential is the Clifford commutator with this gamma. And in this way, we get a G differential algebra, and now the cohomology is trivial, except if G is abelian. Okay, and now we would like to get something like this last example, but for the quantized version. And for this, it is good to consider this uh, sigma commutators. So you see, again, the quantum Clifford algebra is the same, but it is different. So for example, you don't want to use the the ordinary commutators, but you use the sigma commutators, which involve the braiding. So you take not x, y minus y, x, but you take x, y minus the, you take the braiding and then you multiply something like that. This is the precise formula. And you also take the sign into account. And then we have our, our uh, differential they are given exactly like for the classical case for the Clifford algebra, but with the sigma commutators in place of ordinary commutators. Not, not gonna draw, go through the formula. So I'm basically at the end of my time. So this should be like an example of something that's gonna be defined now. So a Q deformed SL2 differential algebra is an algebra B together with an action of UQSL2 an action of wedge Q V2, the Berenstein Zwick Nagel quantum exterior algebra, and the differential. And there is the usual compatibility. So Lx should be the commutator of iota X and B. And then the theorem is that this definition fits the previous example. And then there is the last slide which is even more open-ended so i'm gonna just let it okay i'll come back to it but first i have this slide thank you and then in case you want to leave this thank you very much it should be this this quantum ethereal algebra. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes.
Yeah, the cubic Dirac operator was finished, and then there was something else. Just, just justifying the definition of PQ specific. Yeah, trying to, so this is maybe a view towards generalizing the whole thing. So one of the things we have to generalize is the Clifford algebra, and this is some extra structure that should help with that, but we are not yet sure. So this is. Yeah, so we are concerned. So typically, like at least classically, I know much more about the classical situation. So what you have, you have some some module for the enveloping algebra, and then you always have to spinnerize it. So you tensor it with the spin module, and then you get this whole algebra acting, in particular the Dirac operator. Now your module uh, for the Lie algebra could come from some geometry. It could be some sections of some vector bundle, yes. But you always have to take the spin vector bundle. And then, yeah, and that's actually very useful. This is how they constructed the discrete series representations, for example. So you make some spin bundle on G mod K, and then you take the kernel of the Dirac operator, and there you get your, your very interesting discrete series representation. That was like one of the first ways how it was constructed. Yeah, so classically, I could give another talk about that, yes. But in quantum setting, I don't know. So we only know this. No, 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 it can be much more general. So in the quantum world, we could so far only handle SO2, but classically, everything is. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So in the classical setting, it's more like you have just this one in the, com so you complexify everything. You consider just this one operator, but then it depends like what kind of models you study. This is where you get your stars. They come from the structure on the module. So it's a little different. So I, I in fact, I don't know. I haven't thought about this. Maybe you could do something like we have here also, yes, to have the star operation completely algebraically. Thank you, we do need to move on. I just want to make one very quick comment from the chair. Um, the answer to your question about what is the bridge of the algebra, uh, what is it kind of the algebra? Uh, in this, this example, there is a four dimensional thing where you just add the C. As soon as you add the C, uh -huh. then you exactly get a four dimensional bridge of the algebra, which generates E to G. You see that's the two. Oh, okay. So it's exactly what you're using perhaps without realizing it. And that's in lives in the category of E to S for two modules, the bridge category. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it doesn't obey. It obeys weird. It weighs graded version of Lie algebra. Okay. Okay. So if you can show me what it looks like for SL three, I will be very happy. Okay. Very good. Excellent. All right. Uh, so let's move on. So let's have a good break while they set up. Uh, let's have a next talk. Last night, the speaker. Was